So I want to uh, look at the next part of John's Gospel. Uh, I've been chuntering my way through John for the last couple of years, and uh, we're going to look at that uh, again now uh, uh, together. Um, this, uh, this morning at 9 o'clock, I posted the next part of John, or the previous part to this, uh, but that's the, the last time I'm going to do something on a Sunday. So we're just going to put these out on Wednesdays or midweek. And John is uh, telling us the words of Jesus about peace. I don't know how you feel at peace. I don't know whether you feel rested and peaceful in heart or whether we're anxious or stressed or whatever. Um, I want to show you a little cartoon. And... Um, these cartoons are a remarkable. I love Charlie Brown, as lots of you know. Charles Schultz uh, died maybe 20, 25 years ago. These cartoons were written in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, and yet they, they still speak into our life today. And uh, Lucy is pretending or, or attempting to be a psychiatrist or an advisor or an agony aunt or something. And uh, Snoopy is anxious and worried. And uh, she says, it used to be that a person could live isolated from the world's problems. Then it got to be that we all knew everything that was going on. And remember, this is before the internet, this is before social media. It then got to be that we knew everything that was going on. The problem now is that we know everything about everything except what's going on. And that was just from TV and the radio and newspapers, but we are bombarded with stuff. That's why you feel nervous. Five cents, please. And uh, Snoopy says, I'm short a nickel, I'm still nervous, and I still don't know what's going on. <laughs> we live in a t period of history where perhaps more human beings, more of us, more of our culture are anxious than it would appear uh, than ever before. And there are lots of different reasons for that. But nevertheless, our culture is nervous, apprehensive, uncertain. Dilbert Carton, this is much more recent, uh, his dog says, you have two choices in life. You can be bored or you can be anxious. And I think that's pretty well true that, that uh, our culture is faced with those two questions. And... Uh, Dilbert says, I'm never bored because I can just look at, my, at stuff on my phone. And that's where our culture is. We are absolutely apprehensive about being bored. And so we do everything we can to not be bored. The real thing in life is to avoid boredom. But his dog says, does it make you feel anxious? And Dilbert says, how did you know that? So the reality is that all this information, all this stuff that we are getting is making us feel anxious. And Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. How is it that we find peace? Dan, can I just ask you to just close that, that door for us, sorry, as we're thinking about peace. How do I find peace? What does Jesus mean when he says that he gives us peace? He says, a peace I'll leave with you. We've been chuntering our way through John, and we'll know that or, or, or just to, to remind you that, that, that these few chapters are all one sort of conversation on the night that Jesus is about to be betrayed. Within minutes, within an hour or two of uh, Judas coming and him, Jesus being arrested. And he's talked about his anxiety. He's talked about his, uh, that he's going to leave them. And when he says here that uh, peace I leave with you, what he's saying is that the physical uh, Jesus, as, you know, with flesh that they could reach out and touch... He's going. He's going to leave them within hours. But they will still have God's peace. 
So we're going to ask ourselves three questions. What is the peace of Jesus? How do we deal with anxiety and fear? And how can we receive peace from Jesus? He's talked about, in, in, and you can find all of these on our, our YouTube site or our website. Oh, we've gone through John verse by verse, and, and there's loads there for you to look at. He's talked about he's going to go, but he's going to send the Spirit, his Spirit, the Holy Spirit, another advocate to help them. This morning I put up uh, talking about God making his home within us. And that leads us to this place, my peace I give you. But what does this mean? What is the peace that God is bringing to us? What is it that he is offering us? What does it mean? And I want to say right at the very beginning that it is not the absence of fear or anxiety. And I say this on lots of occasions, that I believe God created us as human beings to be afraid of things. And I know that there's sometimes a view that fear is wrong and it's sinful or anxiety is wrong or sinful. I want to say quite clearly I don't believe that at all. I believe God has created human beings to be fearful of things. That's why you, get, you walk a little faster across the road when a car comes round that corner down there faster than you expect it to and you just woke a little bit quicker because we're wired to see danger. We're wired to do something when something is putting us at risk. The problem, like so many of our human um, uh, uh, drives, is that it can go awry. But at its bottom level, to be anxious about things is a good thing. And it is a motivation for action. It makes us walk a little bit faster faster, because that car is coming faster than we anticipated. And our human frailty is not going to be removed. I don't believe that Jesus is promising that we are never anxious. One of the, the things that you note, and again, if you go back and join, you'll see that I looked at these these things is that Jesus has talked about himself being troubled. I, mean, I know it's a verse or two before, but in reality, it's a minute or two before. He talks about being troubled about what is about to happen, that he is about to be arrested. He's about to have a crown of thorns put upon his head. He's about to be whipped on his back. He is about to be crucified. He doesn't look forward to that. He's about to go and, 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 and cry out to God in Gethsemane. He is anxious. It says he was troubled, deeply troubled. He talks about being troubled about Judas. He knew what Judas was about to do. It isn't so much that if Judas hadn't betrayed Jesus, he wouldn't have been arrested and he wouldn't have died. It isn't all Judas' fault. It isn't that we blame Judas for the cross. It's that Jesus was going to see the hurt and pain of a friend misunderstanding everything and making poor choices. And he grieves over Judas's heart. And he says that he is troubled. And when I looked at this um, a few months, a few, not a few months, I don't know, a few weeks ago, and you'll find the video, we talked about how Jesus is troubled. But when he, and he says at the beginning of this chapter in John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. He's saying, difficulty comes. But don't let it become what defines you. Don't let it plant a, a, a roots into our hearts. We may experience fear and anxiety in our mind, and we need to address that and deal with it. We mustn't let it take root in our hearts. And Jesus isn't calling any of us to a life of comfort and ease yet. That is what heaven holds for us. But he asks and invites you and I to take up our cross. He calls us to follow him through resistance, through opposition, through ridicule, through persecution, through suffering, through spiritual warfare. I'm going to explore in a moment what this peace is, but let's be right clear at the very beginning. It is not some absence of anxiety that none of us have ever experienced, but we think perhaps super spiritual people have. It's not that, because that's unhuman. And uh, I've talked about this before recently, but you know, around about five o'clock every Saturday night, I begin to get anxious about Sundays. That anxiety 
motivates me to be prepared. It may not look like I'm prepared. It may look like it's a complete mishmash. But believe you me, quite a lot of time would be, would be even worse if it was unprepared. Um, the anxiety is a motivation to get things ready. And some of the things we're anxious about is God saying, I want you to think about this. I want you to prepare for it. I want you to take this seriously. I want you to believe that this matters. I want you to do it right. Jesus says, I do not give you peace as the world gives. So what is the world's kind of peace? And how is the peace that Jesus is going to bring? I'm going to explain to you in a moment. How is that different? I want to suggest five things about the peace that our culture brings or thinks will bring peace. And the first one is denial. And so we deny the things that rob us of peace. We just say, well, they don't exist or they don't matter or they're not true. So we deny ourselves a feeling of guilt or shame or, or um, feeling not good enough. We just try and blot that out. And we do that in lots of different ways. But one of the ways that the world does that is through drowning out, is through um, just uh, filling our minds with something else that's louder. It might be music. But it might be uh, the noise of of buying things. It might be the, the, the filling our, our, our lives with, with the excitement of shopping, of gadgets and phones and cars and houses and clothes. It might be with alcohol or, or, or smoking something or inhaling something or snorting something or popping something or I don't know. But there's ways in which we just try and, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about that. I'm not going to think about it. That's the peace that the world brings, and it isn't peace. And when we try and find things to distract and things to take our mind off it, but what really is troubling us still is there. It's there when we come round the next morning. It's there when we finish shopping. It's there when the music stops. It's there in the middle of the night at three in the morning when we have nothing else to distract us. It's still there. And Jesus' peace is not like that. He's giving something different. One of the other ways that human beings try and find peace in our culture is a sense of superiority. We find peace by making other people look bad. We laugh at them. We, we troll them on, on, on social media. We make comments about them. We talk to other people about them. We gossip about them. We just try and present this idea that as long as we can tread on somebody else and push them down, we will feel better about ourselves. We think that we will get higher if we can make somebody lower. And it doesn't work. It isn't a real peace. It's not a peace that lasts. It's a peace that the world gives, but it's not the peace that Jesus brings. The peace that Jesus brings is not about being better than somebody else, and neither is it about blame. Neither is it about being focused on who has caused our problems and seeking revenge or retaliation or just wanting everybody to know that it's somebody else's fault. This is the peace that the world brings, and it doesn't work and it doesn't last what can I do to fix my social anxiety, uh, says Dilbert. His dog says, try keeping in mind that no one cares about you whatsoever. Now, I don't think that's really very helpful or effective. <laughs> How do we find peace when the root of, what we f of maybe our lack of peace is how we perceive and feel about ourselves? It's working, but I think it might be creating a new problem. I don't care. So what is the peace that Jesus wants to give? What is the peace that Jesus wants to leave with us? I want to suggest it's a supernatural thing. It's a miraculous thing. It's a faith-driven calmness. It's not the removal of fear or anxiety. It's a faith-driven faith calmness. It is an awareness of problems. It's an experience of problems. But it is not being consumed by them or paralyzed by them. And we're going to unpack that uh, as we go on. And if you want to text a question, Kath will, will, will field that for me, or rather throw it at me, and we'll work it out together. And the text number is there on the screen. Uh, so what does it mean? I want to suggest eight things. Uh, that don't, uh, that, uh, they don't all begin with the same letter because I'm not a proper preacher. Uh, 
just eight things that I think the peace of Jesus is and what he wants to do by his spirit coming into our life supernaturally to transform us. The first thing is cleansing, removing guilt. So one of the first things that causes a lack of peace is a sense of shame, a sense of guilt, a sense of failure, a sense of being unable to move past the things that we have done wrong, the relationships perhaps that have broken, the, 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 the things we have failed in, the things we're no good at, the things that we, we really hate about ourselves, the things that we wish we didn't do, hadn't done, couldn't do. And the good news of Jesus is that he comes to wash, to cleanse, to remove, to, to set us free. It's a miraculous thing, but it's a powerful thing. For each of these things, I'm going to pop a little scripture on the screen. And uh, you can go back and look at this on a Wednesday. It will come out on uh, Wednesday as a video. Uh, if you're what, listening to this on a podcast, we also do the podcast. You can, wherever you get podcasts, you can download it. But you might want to go to the uh, video to see these scriptures because I'm not going to refer to them every time. But there are lots of scriptures that are just going to f- be on the screen for you to hold you. Jesus wants to set us free from guilt. I know it looks like religion wants to create guilty people, and I know that there are religious folks who seem to enjoy making people feel guilty. The good news is, Jesus wants you and I to be free from guilt. And that only comes when we bring our our, our dirt to him. And say, Lord, I'm sorry. Will you cleanse and forgive me? And the second area of peace is that he brings worth removing self-hatred because the good news of Jesus is that you and I are worth the death of Jesus. We are worth his blood being shed for us. We are worth him coming, being born amongst the cattle on a manger and living in humanity and being ridiculed and being rejected. We are worth him going through what he was troubled by, the the, the rejection of Judas and the crown of thorns and the the, the whip whipping his flesh off his back. We, You and I are worth it. He does that. That, not because he wants to punish mankind, but because he wants to save mankind, because he wants humanity to be with him forever in heaven. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be with him forever. He wants you to be free from the pain of this world because you and I are worth something. We are worth the precious blood of Jesus. We have a value. Uh, Jesus says, look, you're worth more than any other creation. Even the hairs on your head are numbered, which is easier for God in in one or two of our cases. The next one, he wants to bring a future hope, removing despair. He wants us to know that all that is difficult and painful is not eternal. And that we believe that there is a life to come where all the sadness, all the pain, all the death, all the mourning will disappear. That the decay that we've experienced in our bodies, the loss of our hair, the wrinkling of bits, the, the aches of bits, the deterioration, all of that will be gone. And whatever we find now that's difficult and painful and unbearable to hold on to one day will be the past and so we don't live in despair that the very worst of times is all times we live with a hope we fix our eyes not on what is seen but what is unseen for we light and momentary troubles are achieving for us something that far outweighs them all We fix our eyes partly, yes, on the problems, but also on the future. He wants to bring a gratitude that removes bitterness. So these are all things that rob us of peace, and he wants to set us free. He wants to bring us into his presence and to be able to see what God has done in our life and be thankful, be able to help us to see who God is and be thankful, and to discover the incredible power of worship transforming the focus on what isn't towards the focus of what is and to remove bitterness and to discover the joy and wonder of being grateful. And there may be things that are going on right today that we can't be grateful for. 
But somewhere behind that and underneath that, there will be things that we can. And so we fix our eyes not just on the future, but we fix our eyes on what is good that sometimes is hidden by what is bad and it transforms us. And we need to be people who are of gratitude. And these are the gifts that he brings. This is what his spirit will do. This is what Jesus is leaving with us. He's leaving with us a contentment that removes envy. This is a miraculous thing. But we come to God and we say, Lord, I'm struggling because I wish I was them. I wish I had their job. I wish I had their personality. I wish I had their money. I wish I had their family. I wish I had their health. Lord, set me free from being consumed with jealousy and envy. And God, in his miraculous power by his spirit, comes and brings us a contentment, a contentment that doesn't come by getting what we want, but by accepting what we have. And Philippians talks about, uh, Paul talks in Philippians about discovering a peace that passes all understanding that comes from a contentment, and we cry out to God, and he wants to bring that and give that, a contentment that removes envy, wise guidance that removes foolish conformity or ambition. So, so much of our anxieties may be caused by poor decision-making because we've abandoned God's values and scriptures. One of the things we've been doing in our 8.30 call to prayer over the last two weeks, please do have a look at those. They're there online for you. We've been exploring the commands that God brings and how precious they are. We've been celebrating what is good about what God in, instructs us to do and how that brings life. And so it's one of the peace that God wants to bring is to protect us from mistakes and from stupidity. Mary says, as she is aware of carrying Jesus, that he is to guide us, guide our feet into path of peace. He wants to guide us. So let's follow his word. Let's do what he asks of us. He wants to bring a purpose that removes emptiness, a sense of futility and what's the point. And the peace that God brings comes out of discovering why we've been made. Why do we have life? Why do we have breath? Why are we in this town, in this place at this time, in these relationships? Because he wants us to love. He wants us to bless. He wants us to love God with all our heart. And that is expressed by loving our neighbor. We can have everything else in the world, but if we have not love, we are nothing. We find meaning when we seek to love and lastly he wants to bring his presence removing isolation we live in a culture where we are surrounded by people we can talk to people at any point on our phones but we feel alone there's no greater loneliness than being in a crowd being in messages but it's just on a screen and we don't feel Anybody really knows us or cares for us or loves us. And we need the experience of God to say, I know you and I am with you and I care for you. And these words that are spoken in Deuteronomy are said again and again throughout the Bible and Hebrews applies them to us again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So here's eight things that the peace of Jesus is. Cleansing, removing guilt. Worth, removing self-hatred. Future, removing despair. Gratitude, removing bitterness. Contentment, removing envy. Wise guidance, removing foolish uh, uh, conformity or ambition. Purpose, removing emptiness. Presence, removing isolation. And I was trying to think in my mind how one might explain that and what that might look like. And I've kind of visualized it a little bit. This may help you. Uh, it may confuse you. If it confuses you, just skip on to something else. But if you have a, a, a kind of a graphy thing, I apologize for those of you who've left school long behind, and I apologize even more for those of you trying to forget school. Uh, what are the, uh, the, the, the line? What is it, AM accesses? I'm getting loads of different answers. 
who knows? It's an up and a down and a side. Anyway, up there, some human experiences ranging from elation to despair and, and time. And I reckon that sometimes life without the peace of Christ is a little bit like this. And it's very sharp. It's very pointed. And there are extremes. And it's hard. And, we not, and without Christ, there is real despair. And there may be a, 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 something that feels like elation. And other people for life without Christ is all down the bottom and it's difficulty and despair. And again, it's sharp and it's painful. And in my mind, the peace that Christ brings looks like this. It's softer and it never goes to the bottom. It never goes to emptiness and despair. I know some of you will debate with me that it never goes to elation. That's in heaven, I think. Because we live in a world of sadness and not quite yet. And there are things that are broken and wrong in this world. But we know joy. She's here tonight, but we know joy. <laughs> That's a pathetic joke. We know joy, but maybe not yet elation. And Paul, I think, puts it really well in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians is a really good book to read about suffering. Really good book. He says, we have this treasure in jars, this treasure, God within us, the Spirit of God, the Word of God. We have this within us. We are clay. We are boring, broken, fragile pots. But God is a treasure within us. And why? Because it's all surpassing powers from God and not from us. He says, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We experience difficulty, but not despair. We are, per we are perplexed, but not in despair. I've always found these verses so helpful. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. And God brings peace in the midst of difficulty. It's not the absence of trouble. So our second question, we're going to through, go this through the second and third questions a little bit quicker each time. How do we deal with anxiety and fear? What does that mean? Do not let your hearts be troubled. I want to suggest that the Bible invites us to be overcomers not captives. Let me try and illustrate that uh, by a moment. Imagine that this chair represents uh, elation, it represents joy, it represents all the goodness of heaven that we want to get to. But there is an obstacle, there is a barrier, there is a difficulty. And uh, it may be, and, and it is that we fear that, we're afraid of this obstacle and barrier and difficulty. And the Bible talks about us being overcomers, not captives. And someone who is captive is stuck on this side. And all we can see is the obstacle. And we are unable to move beyond it. We're unable to go around it. We're unable to get ahead. And maybe we even lose sight of what is to come. And all we see is the problem and the difficulty. The Bible talks so much, uses this word about overcoming. Overcoming means you go over it. You recognize it's there, but you go beyond it to the place that we want to be, the place of restoration, of healing, of redemption, of no more sorrow. And so all that God is asking us to do is not to be stuck here, but to have half an eye on that and to, with the power of his spirit, to overcome. So how do we do that? Uh, we, firstly, we need to identify and address credible threats. We talked a lot about this in the Questions of Life that Kath did and I did a few months ago. You can look at I can't remember what it's called, probably anxiety or stress or something. Google something like that on our YouTube site. We talked about the importance of trying to work out the thing that's making me anxious. What is it? Because this vague, nagging feeling of anxiety is problematic. We need to identify, is it coming from guilt? Is it coming from what I've got to do tomorrow morning? Is it coming from something that may never happen? Is it coming from what other people are saying? Is it coming from, where is it coming from? So we need to identify, and we address the credible threat. Tomorrow morning, I've got to do a talk. Tomorrow morning, I've got this interview. 
Tomorrow morning, I've got this conversation. We identify what's real, what is in front of us, and we ask God to help us. We, we use it as a prompt. Like I said about my, my anxiety about Sundays makes me prepare through the week, makes me make slides and try and, and, and get it ready. And, and it, it, use, it, it helps us to do something. And doing something is always part of overcoming. And we may not know what to do, but we do something. We go forward. We don't stay here in a place of despair and paralysis. Sister Chan Hyong says this, if we worry about the big picture, we are powerless. So my secret is to start right away doing whatever little work I can do. I try to give to one person in the morning and remove the suffering of one person in the afternoon. Try to give joy to one person in the morning and remove the suffering of one person in the afternoon. This is the secret. Start right now. We take our eyes off what is troubling us, and we look at what we can do, what we should do. And if we don't know what to do, we can love and care for someone. And we face, uh, we, we face the problem, and we say, God, will you help me? We bring it to him. We acknowledge it. We don't try and deny it. We don't try and drown it out. We don't try and tread on somebody else or, or blame somebody else. We face it, and we say, God, will you help me? And we remember that courage is not the absence of fear, it's the going through fear. And when God says again and again and again, do not be afraid, he isn't saying there's something wrong with you that you're afraid. He isn't saying that. He's saying do not let your fear hold you here. Go forward with me and we will overcome rather than be captive to the fear. We focus on what lies beyond, where there is no more sorrow, no more tears, no more sadness. We focus on what is to come. And we prayerfully seek freedom from the improbable and distant threats. Because you see, if I am worried about something that isn't going to happen, or if it is going to happen, I don't know when it's going to happen, and like Jesus says, you know, do not worry about tomorrow. Today's got enough stuff. I say to God, Lord, help me take my mind off what isn't rational. I'm going to come back to that at the end with a prayer. But it's so important to say, what's real that I need to deal with today? And what is not real? And it, they're not all talking about me behind my back. And it isn't all going to c c fall in tomorrow. Fear, F-E-A-R, has two meanings. Forget everything and run, or face everything and rise. We face it. We don't stay this side. We overcome. We go over. We overcome. And we know where we are going and who is with us. So when we experience uh, things such as uncertainty and we're vague and with the problem tomorrow feels difficult, we don't know what's going to happen, we don't know what we're going to face, we know what is to come in the future and we know who is with us and so we go forward. When we are experiencing failure or shame or rejection and so many things that are going wrong in our lives, we know where we're going. We're going to a place of forgiveness and grace and welcome, and we know who is with us, the, our Savior, who loves us, who has uh, given his life for us and values us. And so we overcome our failure, our shame, and our uh, fear of rejection. When we are experiencing sadness, and things that are not right, and pain, and things that are broken, desperately broken in this world, we overcome because we see what is to come. And we know who is with us. And one day, all that is causing us pain will be gone. And all that is broken will be mended. And we may fear death or destruction or separation and bereavement and grief and the loss of loved ones, and we've experienced that. But one day, we will be reunited. And what we now know is that it is temporary. We are focusing on where we're going and who is with us. 
And when we fear isolation and abandonment and being alone, we know where we are going and we know who is with us. How can we receive peace from Jesus? I don't know whether this picture experience says peace to you. It does to me. It's just, these are trees that I took a couple of weeks ago just around the corner from me in Sutton. And, and somebody, I now discover there's two people in Sutton that have got phone boxes in their, in their um, front gardens. I didn't know that, but this, I think it's great. It speaks to me of peace in the midst of turmoil. It may not speak to you of that. How do we receive peace from Jesus? I want to suggest some things very quickly before Kath comes to ask some questions. Firstly, we breathe in Scripture. We hear the Word of God. We hear what he's saying. All those Scriptures that we've used already, we breathe them in. Lord, I want to receive your Word. I want to receive the truth of what you are saying about who I am, what is to come, what is the purpose of life, how I am meant to live, what I am grateful for. I breathe it in. And I breathe out praying. I breathe out saying, Lord, help me. I bring my problems, my difficulties, my fears, my anxieties. I bring them to God. Notice the way around. We don't breathe in the problems. We breathe in Scripture. And we breathe it out in prayer. Lord, help me. Have mercy, Lord. We breathe in hope. We breathe in what is to come. And we breathe out gratitude. Philippians 4, uh, the verse next to this uh, talks about a peace that passes all understanding. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Again, he is not saying you are wrong to have anxiety. He's saying move beyond the anxiety. How do you do that? You do it by prayer and petition, by bringing everything to God. If you don't have anxiety, then you don't need to pray. That's not what Paul is talking about. He's talked about how he's hard-pressed from every side. He is not saying there's something wrong with us for being anxious. He's saying don't stay in the place of anxiety. But in every situation, by prayer and thanksgiving, present your request. Prayer and thanksgiving. We breathe out gratitude. We may not be able to thank God for what has happened today, but we may be focused on what he's done yesterday and what he's going to do. We breathe in guidance. Lord, show me your word. Show me your way. Show me how to live. Show me how to have trust in your commands. And we breathe that action. We don't stay stuck here in a place, a, a, a slough of despond. That's the word, isn't it? Slough of Despond. It's not a place. I have been to Slough. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress, isn't it? There you go. Pilgrim's Progress. We don't stay in a Slough or or a Reading or whatever. We move forward. And we move forward by seeking to bless and care and love others. In a moment, Kath is going to come and ask some questions, but I want to help us with the prayer that many of you will know, the prayer of serenity that is used in the 12-step program, Uh, but it's it's a longer prayer than that is used. Uh, There's more to it. I'm going to show you the whole context of it, but it is so powerful about peace. She starts off, says, God, give us the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. to work out what's, what I need to deal with and what I need to accept. Give us the grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed. Courage to change the things that should be changed. And the wisdom to distinguish one from the other. And then the prayer goes on, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you'll make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may reasonably be happy in this life. I love this phrase. This to me is a secret of life. I'm asking God that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Perspective. 
and balance. What fears and anxieties do we need to bring to Jesus to overcome and not be captive to? What words of hope do we need to focus on by faith? What false sources of peace do we need to turn from and towards Jesus? Cass is going to come and uh, lead us in some questions. And we'll pop that prayer back now. Judy, I'll sit on this one. You can have that one. There you go. We're going we're gonna to mess up the cameras completely for these guys, so apologies for that upstairs. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. If you want to text in a question quickly, it's a good chance to do it right now, because once we get into it, it's harder for Kath to uh, listen and read and ask and... Do you think I listened to you? Well, I'm hoping you listened to me. Slight problem with that. Is that all right, Dave? We okay? Dave's going, yeah. You got that special filter on for me. Zoomed in. No. Richard, is that okay for you? Perfect. Okay, I'm going to start off by um, asking you just to clarify a couple of things. So you put the graph up there. And there's a couple of questions I want to start with looking at the graph. Mm. First question is this. So does that mean that if you feel despair and the stuff at the bottom of the chart, that you don't have Christ in your life? What about times like getting a cancer diagnosis or the death of a child? Doesn't Jesus carry us in our despair? And was Jesus not in despair in Gethsemane? It's a great question. I guess it, it all depends what we mean by despair. Uh, I believe that God wants us... I think there'll be things that we get thrown in in life that put us in a place of despair, and that is not where God wants us to have to live or stay. Mm -hmm. He wants to take us out of that very quickly and for us to find a, a place of hope. We all imperfectly um, know Jesus. And the, this, what's so really important is not to have this condemnation of, oh, I, I'm not happy enough. or uh, It's just that to hear God's heart is that he wants to lift us out of a place of despair. So I wouldn't want people who feel I'm in despair. Um, but I guess what I would say, which is probably not verifiable or provable, is that the darkest despair with Jesus is not as dark as the darkest despair without him. Yeah, 100%, but I still think there will be times, unfortunately, because we're humans and the human race is broken, where we're going to face despair. Yeah. It's just part of life. So I don't think we can expect not to experience that. And if we do, there's nothing wrong with us. Mm. And Jesus will meet us in it. Okay, second question from the graph. Uh, in your graph, joy is presented as an experience at odds with sadness, difficulty, and contentment. We go from one thing to the other. But Philippians 4 exhorts us to rejoice in the Lord always. Is joy a constant choice and possibility or a temporary feeling we can do nothing about? We did a thing on joy, didn't we? It is, it is a really complex thing. I don't think joy in, is a feeling. I think it's this sense of being able to see what God, how he sees us, his love, what he's done for us, and to hold that sense of gratitude. And there will be times when we feel joyous, and there are times when it's a choice mm -hmm. to, to focus on that. Uh, I think it's, it's really difficult, because like joy, like despair, these words mean different things to each of us. Um, so I don't, yeah, you, 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 we, we did do a thing on this, didn't we? We did. We did. So I think, that, I think it is... You, have, you can have joy alongside difficulty. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think it's a choice. I think it's the way that we look at life 
uh, and what we choose to focus on because we can be introverted and focusing on everything that's going wrong or we can be looking out and focusing on just little things that actually will lift our spirit or little things in scripture that will then in turn work within us and bring about some lifting and some joy. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna keep going, so we've got quite a few. Is peace an emotion or a state? Can we be in the storm, but be at peace, have a state of calm, even though feeling anxious about the external things going on? Is it an internal calm? Uh, yeah. It, well, again, I think peace is... Paul says it's a peace that passes understanding. But my, my observation is it's more calmness than we would be without Jesus. Mm -hmm. Those of us that are very anxious will still experience some anxiety. Mm -hmm. But with Jesus, it's, it's, it's softened, it's, it's dulled, it's much less than without Jesus. Um, so it, 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 it is a calmness, it is a hope. It is a sense that this problem is not all there is. And I think that's this thing about the, the place of hopelessness mm -hmm. is not where God ever wants us to be, where we think, this is really difficult and painful, but there's something to come beyond. Sometimes the peace of God is just a stilling of things that enables us to be, to sleep or to have wisdom or to know what to do. It, it expresses itself in different ways, I think. Yeah, and I think for each person it's different, and for each person it's different at different times. So I can look back, say, to uh, the night before I had my back operation, uh, completely paralysed, and um, was having an operation, and there were three things that could happen. Number one, I could die. Number two, it would be worse, and I would be uh, immobile for the rest of my life. Or number three, it would work. And I remember I had a load of people praying for me, and probably lots of morphine. But that night and that morning, I felt just a, a complete sense of peace. I slept for the first time in I don't know how long. I woke up in the morning a little bit anxious. I'm going into surgery, but a sense of God's with me, God's in this, whatever will be, will be. Whereas other times, I perhaps haven't felt quite that sense of peace, but I've known that God is with me. But there's still been an underlying churning and a little mm -hmm. bit of anxiousness. See, I think a lot of it depends on what it is that's robbing us of peace. If it is something rational and incredibly unpleasant, like major surgery, then we shouldn't be surprised that we're anxious and God meets us in that place. If what's robbing us of peace is a deep sense of guilt and shame, then we discover that God really does want to take that away. And so that's a, that we, we need to pursue that kind of peace. Mm -hmm. If what's robbing us of peace is a, a, a sense of uh, bitterness and anger and resentment, then we need to discover that God really, really wants to take that away. So it, it's about recognizing what is robbing us of peace. Is it something that's real and difficult, or is it something that God's, the scriptures have said he wants to remove? And I think sometimes we can't always see that for ourselves, so I think there's an element of inviting God to reveal that or talking about it with somebody else, or a small group, or one person, and just saying, I'm really struggling, uh, I'm feeling fearful or anxious, and that person just saying, oh, I'll be all right, read scripture, but saying, let's unpack it, let's pray about it, let's begin to narrow it down. What is it that is going on? Is it a specific situation? Let's pray into that, let's talk about that. Is it guilt? Is it something that's unconfessed? Mm -hmm. Is it anger? Is it what have you? And that's where the community comes in, I think, yeah. working alongside God, to actually help us. Um, and so it kind of works into the next question. Do you have to do something yourself to accept or experience Jesus' peace? If so, what? I think we have to try and clarify, work out what it is that's robbing us of peace. Mm -hmm. It may then for require confession. It may require us to work on gratitude. It may require us to work on obedience. It may require us to ask for God's help to forgive or to let go. Um, and it certainly will always require us to say, God, will you help me mm -hmm. and, and give me peace? Uh, but again, 
if you're facing a very difficult thing tomorrow, that, it's human. Mm -hmm. it will, that's, we're likely to feel anxiety. So there are things that we can do, but it all depends on what it is that's robbing us of peace. And what would say if there's someone here tonight that's struggling with that to maybe ask for prayer from somebody Absolutely. else? Absolutely. Invite them to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to just have that sense of peace. Yeah. Okay, here's some specifics. How do you find peace knowing someone you love uh, is dying and they don't know Jesus? These are really painful things, aren't they? Absolutely. Um, I think there are... The, 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 the prayer, the courage to change the things that could be changed. There are times when we just have to put something in God's hands. And I sometimes find that helpful to, to visualize that, to take a stone or write something to maybe put it at the, at, a, at the foot of a cross or to visualize. There are times when we just say, God, I can't hold this. It's too painful. I need to place it in your hands. I need to ask you to, to hold it for me. Um, and I think to gather other people around, to talk about it, to express it, to not bottle it, to gather around friends around us who pray, who don't give easy glib answers, but just say, yep, that's painful. Really, really painful things have to be expressed not avoided. It's not denial. It's not like the world gives where we're trying to say it's not there. We, we just... We acknowledge it and we ask God to be in it with us. And I'd also encourage us to go back to scripture that looks at scriptures like God loved the world, God wants none to perish. And this sense that even though on the outside we may look at the person that's dying and think they don't know Jesus, God is pursuing that person. God loves that person as much as he loves everybody else. And it's a matter also of encouraging that person to gather others around to pray for the person, to pray that they would be open to responding to a God who will actively pursue each one of us till our very last breath because he loves us so much because he wants us in heaven with mm. him. That's kind of like the, the positives that go with the negatives. There's mm. a sense of expressing this is terrible, but we can do something about it. We can pray. We can go back to scripture, remind ourselves of, of God's goodness. Okay, keep going? Yeah. Okay. For a moment or two, we need to let Sheila come and lead us for a bit. Okay. Go on. How do we prayerfully seek freedom from improbable or distant threats? What do we do with an underlying feeling or worry that isn't rational? Big question. I think we, we, the, it's a really important step to have recognized that it's improbable and irrational. That's huge. And therefore, to bring that to God. It may be that our brain is over over functioning and we may need to get expert professional help to slow the brain down a bit stop it uh, going at 100 miles an hour um, I, I think sometimes it's uh, it, it, it's asking God and to recognize when we're going into that spiral and saying God you know I can see my, myself thinking these things and I need to stop will you help me Maybe gathering folks around us again and saying, this is me, will you help me? Will you remind me when I'm doing this? But I think to be able to recognize it is so key. The biggest problem is when we don't recognize it. But I think also, if we've just got this nagging thing and we don't know what it is, we can want, what we talked about before, we're asking God to reveal that. And to, It may be that we think it's irrational, but there's something else that we're misplacing because it's so fearful we don't want to face it that we need to come back to and look at us. And maybe that's where counselling is really helpful, to try and work out why do we think that way, what's gone on, and just being with somebody who's really wise at asking questions that unravel and unpack our mind and why we assume things. And that's why community is so important, and it's to be a community of love, of grace, of mercy, not of shame, not of condemnation. I think some people sometimes feel inadequate or people will judge them or I'm not a good Christian because I feel anxious, but it's part of life. Mm. And the, the sooner we are open and honest and have sessions like this where we can talk about it, where we can pray about it, I think the better. Yeah. Do you want to call that quits because we could go on all night? I guess so, yes. yes. And if you think there's nothing else that's burning, yep. 